Hey guys, this is Devin with a uh, short, quick little pre-addendum to the uh, the episode you're about to watch. So as you've probably already seen on Facebook and uh, Tumblr and the TO and other places, we have an interview coming up. Um, on August 28th, we are going to be interviewing Will Ryan and Katie Lee. It's really exciting. So please, please, please send your questions into odysseyoddcast at gmail.com. All one word is down in the description with the links as always, or just put them in the comments. We'll see them. Just make sure that you please send questions into us and do it quickly because there's not a lot of time before this interview. So yeah, we're going to be talking to Will Ryan, voice of Eugene Meltzner, Harlow Doyle, and 94 other characters, the third mainest character on the show, and Katie Lee, who is the second mainest character on the show and has also played dozens and dozens of other characters. These are, you know, two of the longest running and biggest actors on the show, and it's an incredible privilege for us to be able to talk to both of them. So please, please send in your questions. And, 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 and important, no Album 59 spoilers. Please, this interview is going to be done before Album 59 comes out on the radio. So even though lots of you have heard it, I know, please, like the rest of this podcast, please keep it spoiler-free until it comes out on the radio. So no questions pertaining to specific events in 59. You can ask about Jules and Buck and stuff so long as it doesn't pertain directly to things that happen in 59. Other than that, go wild, ask about current events, about past events, about their personal lives and history with the show or with other things that they've worked on in their careers or all sorts of things. Just come up with questions, send them to our email, put them in the comments, and just get really hyped that we get to be able to do this because it's really exciting. Okay, thank you. And uh, now to the episode. hey oh everybody. This is Dem Francis, also known as Leonard Vonsner. And this is Echo. And you're watching the Adventures in Odyssey Oddcast. What are we talking about today, Victoria? We are reviewing the OAC uh, Season 1 soundtrack. Yeah, or the 2014 soundtrack, however you want to qualify it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Music. We're doing music. a music review because they released an instrumental soundtrack music. for Adventures in Odyssey. And like, it is beautiful. I've been waiting for so long for this to happen. Okay, so like long. going going into the soundtrack, I just want to say I was kind of like, eh. but coming out of the soundtrack, I was actually like, like yeah. I've said before, if good. they just released the raw, like just the background music for every episode in its entirety for every single episode, I'd probably listen to it all at least once. Like literally like the full like 25 minutes for every single episode times 760 episodes. Like I would listen to all of that. Just the moments where there's no like music, music at all. Just and it's just music. silence and you're just sitting there. You're like, this is glorious. And it's like, yes. you're not actually listening to anything. That would be me. Yeah. I, I love, love the music on this show. John Campbell is a fantastic composer. I was beyond ecstatic when I heard that they were going to be releasing a soundtrack. You were vibrating with joy. Yeah, so um, when I found out that it was going to be only a f like only for the first season of the OAC and only one song per episode and that they weren't releasing the raw original tracks, that it was a new song written, one for each episode, I was rather disappointed but still excited for the fact that this is happening and that this means that, you know, there's a chance, you know, this is a better start than anywhere else we've ever had before for them to continue releasing soundtracks, not just for OAC albums, but for previous albums and for that to continue happening. And, you know, it's weird because it would save them a lot of time and money to just release all of the raw music instead of paying John Campbell to compose a brand new songs for each episode. Like, yeah. if they could just use the music he's already made all they have to do is pay him licensing fees i don't know i'm uh, not paul i don't know like i've never seen a a series before release a soundtrack where they compose new 
stuff based on the stuff instead of just releasing the music from the composer. I'm not Nathan. I don't have your answer. Anyways, um, so uh, the album art, I'll put it down in the description. It's a vertical... Yeah. A vertical five-way split showing pieces of the episode art from Drake, The Launch Part 1, Kingdom Far Away, Dropbox, and The Lone Lawman, respectively, from left to right. I don't know about you, but when I first saw it, I was like, oh, why did they have to put Lone Lawman in there? Why couldn't they yeah. put the launch? Well, they did put the launch. No, they didn't. It was the second one on there. Oh. They should just put the picture twice. <laughs> well, or they could use the picture Jays, part one so and part two. It has a picture of Jay, because Lone Lawman was a terrible episode. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the description, the OAC description for this uh, album says, <clears throat> For decades, the music of John Campbell has played a vital supporting role on Adventures in Odyssey. In this collection, his dynamic compositions take center stage. From pulsing African rhythms, the launch, and iconic Western swells, the lone lawman, to gentle Asian strings, the dropbox, and warm yuletide stings, the perfect gift, and all by myself. This instrumental album will have you This instrumental album will have you reliving favorite moments from the Odyssey Adventure Club's premiere season. And I'd like to point out that when they listed like the music and the episodes there, that it uh I'm not sure whether the last two lines rhymed intentionally or not. If they didn't, I know, don't know why they used the word stings in there. Seems an odd choice of word for music that heavily relies on Christmas carols. Anyway, so, launching into the tracks, like I said, there's one song for uh, for each episode, so there's 12 songs in all. It's uh, 34 minutes in total, the album, so they're not terribly long. Uh, basically, these my notes on it, and Victoria can interject notes as well, they basically detail the basic structure of most of the songs, along with any thoughts and correlations about the episode and stuff like that as we go through them. My so, my notes are just kind of broad things about the music and compliments. Yeah. Um, so we have the launch part one. So this piece does indeed seem to be, confirming what we suspected, a medley of different tunes from the episodes stuck together. So it would be interesting to try and go back through these episodes and try and pick out the specific instances with each tune, but I think that would be very difficult. Yeah, that's but, what man, I was going to say. Listening to it the first time, like, it felt so good to listen to it. I was so happy just realizing, like, this is a thing that's happening. And this is so good for AIO-related fan stuff that there's now backing music out there, especially since John is always throwing the AIO motif around. Like, no matter what he's doing, what the mood is for the music, whether it's, like, regular Odyssey slice of life, slice of life music or other stuff... The AIO motif is everywhere. He's throwing it around like a yo-yo. Making it rain. The theme. Make it rain. Bo -bo -bo -do -do -do. Um, so uh, the first one is uh, pretty well rounded, and it you know it starts out with a very African vibe, obviously, because you know it takes place in Uganda, northeastern Uganda to be specific. Uh, the launch part two. So launch uh, part two. Devin, <laughs> like about about the sorry about like the thirty second mark or something like that. Like I wasn't gonna take notes or anything, but I did take a couple notes. I took notes on the launch part two, you and I was just like, and it like picked up after things. like twenty seconds, and I was listening to it. I was like, yeah, yeah, and I got like so hyped up, and it was like so intense. I'm like, this is so much better than the first song. This is so great. And then after that, after like forty seconds of that, it just like went into slow stuff. Like it still sounded really good, but I was just like. Oh, <laughs> and I was like, no, go back to how it was before. It sounded so good. So uh, this one was a little bit longer at 429 in length, which is nice. I can't remember if it's the longest one or not. And you have to understand on the OAC, it doesn't say the length of the tracks on the OAC. So it was like it's a the surprise. One. Sorry? It's the longest one. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, it's a surprise clicking on each track how long it's going to be. So... I, it gave me it gave me hope for longer songs down the line than the first one. Uh, 
I didn't end up ha getting redemption for a lot of that hope since this was the longest one. But So uh, this one starts out on a much more intense note, which makes sense because there's all this intertribal conflict. Uh, there's still lots of marimbas, but there's like these subtle dramatic strings. It felt very, very much like a song from the uh, the Riven soundtrack from Mist eerily so like I was, I was like is it? I was like whoa like it sounded like it was right out of the ribbon soundtrack with the marimbas and the strings and the low kind of vibrato. Can I just say while well, I remember to say this when I listened to the last half of the album like I listened to the first half last night I listened to the second half this morning and when I listened to the second half I was on Tumblr and then I think I was listening to like the perfect gift soundtrack song or something like that and then I went on to a blog to look at a post and then the gravity false theme started playing on, on the page because it was ingrained in it and i just paused and I was like man this song sounds a lot like the gravity false theme that's so weird and then i looked i'm like wait it's just they're playing a really quiet part in the gift and i'm listening to the gravity falls theme on this page and i exited it and then it just left i could hear like the really quiet music i'm like yeah that was right but it was so funny man. Autoplay music embeds on Tumblr blogs are the worst thing. But, uh, but I was just like, oh my gosh, it sounds so much like Gravity Falls. That, that's that so weird. Funny. And I thought that for like 15 seconds. So. Um, so the music for this one then, after the slow, ribbon-like part, it eventually takes a, uh, a brighter turn. Not super bright, just kind of gentle and mellow with some kids' choir voices giving gentle like, ah, in the background. Yeah, like, ah, like singing, not like, ah, ah, which is why I wrote gentle ahs in the background so it doesn't sound like a cry of alarm in You're my notes. Probably spiking and then, uh, your mic level. It turns into very joyful at the end of it and clearly represents the end of the episode, everything wrapping up the resolution of the intertribal conflicts and stuff like that. Um, in a kingdom far away, uh, so we have an austere harpsichord and fife melody. It's a uh, very Renaissance sounding as you would expect and lots of more period instruments come in as well like horns and strings and stuff like that and it sounds very Renaissance-y. Uh, it was very short this one um, and I just want to point out on the topic of In a Kingdom Far Away learned because of Steven Universe that Vidalia which is the land in this episode is the uh, uh, type of onion. So, 30 J's Hath September is the shortest track. Yeah, so Vidalia is the name of the land in A Kingdom Far Away, and it's a type of onion, which I learned from Steven Universe because there was a character named Vidalia, and it's Onion's mother. Onion. <laughs> um, this song, it's actually pretty funny. This song flows directly into Drake the Cosmic Copper. Like, it flows in very smoothly, which is funny because this one is like a Renaissance melody, and then it goes into... Drake opens with mostly darkish, mysterious sci-fi sounds and flavors. So it's a really like weird transition. And then it eventually mellows out and it actually brings in the usual um, AIO clarinet and harp strings that we get in lots of the slice of life music. But it still has this distinctly futuristically coded synth sounds and computer noises. I remember that, uh, when, uh, uh, when Drake, the Cosmic Copper started and I was listening to that song, I like paused, I just like jerked, I'm like, what was that? And then I checked what, I was like, what is this? It sounds so weird. And I checked, I'm like, oh, it's like the soundtrack for my favorite episode. And I'm like, never mind. I'm going to read the names of the titles as I wrote them because I start writing them shorter and shorter was the idea because I was in a hurry. And then it's this start of changing the way that I wrote the episode title. So I'll read them as I wrote them. So, I mean, it started out full for the first three and then i just wrote drake this one was just mission on part one or mission unaccomplished um so this one is obviously very african sounding as well uh since we're in kenya for these episodes just outside of nairobi to be specific the style however is very distinct from the first two from the launch so i'm really curious if john just chose a different style under the umbrella of the african motif at random or the stereotypical African motif, I should say. Or if the music in the launch and this one are actually specifically tied to Ugandan and Kenyan music styles, which I really hope, although I slightly doubt. Um, for I Mission Unaccomplished was like the last note I took because I only took the two notes. 
uh, I put mission unaccomplished coming up in coming in with remarkable music, which undoubtedly proves that missionary music episodes have the best music in general. You can definitely tell the precise moment where Matthew has fallen in the river. Yeah, I know. And, I heard that. I'm just like, oh man, it's going down. Matthew yeah. fell in the river. <laughs> it suddenly gets so intense and there's this steady ticking of percussion to subconsciously mark the passage of time in a deadly situation, like time's counting down kind of thing, which I also, in we writing that out, have 10 minutes to save the world. I realized that as I was writing, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that before. The psychology of like an intense moment where they start like a steady drumbeat ticking because it, it feel, makes it feel like a countdown and it makes things feel more tense in a tense situation. I'm um, kicking my hair dryer under my desk. And then uh, the music turns very somber and melancholy for the close of the song, most likely because of what's his face's heart's condition. I totally called that. Remember that, Devin? Yes, I do remember. Uh, I'll never and then we let have you forget. Mission on part two. Uh, this one is understandably opening on a much more subdued tone because now it's starting out with like the whole you know, he's dying and stuff like that. And then after a while, the music picks up to a much happier tone, closing with the AIO motif. Uh, then we have the next one, uh, Jake from State Farm, is what I titled it. Uh, because, like a good neighbor. It wasn't until I was writing out, I was like, oh, it's the State Farm motto. Didn't pick up on that. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Oh. So this My one is... favorite motto is Baskin Robbins always knows. <laughs> Always finds out. <laughs> Always finds out, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we have Jake from State Farm. So uh, being the first Slice of Life episode on this entire list so far, the seventh episode through the season, this one opens with typical Town of Odyssey Slice of Life kind of tunes, but it quickly ducks down into slightly more mysterious tones for the robbery of Red's house. And then this builds until the halfway point, and then it kind of continues on still suspicious tones, but it doesn't sound like so sinister anymore. I, wouldn't ex I w didn't expect such an intrigue-focused score for an episode which is mostly spent, like, friendly chat time-wise in the episode. The entire song was mystery and suspicion for the soundtrack. Um, I don't know. Olivia was handing out some pretty interesting brownies. I'd be <laughs> suspicious. She's yeah. like, hey, want some brownies? And everyone's like, no. And she's like, why Why don't any of the strangers want the brownies? I'm trying to give them. It's like, oh, we don't, gee, Olivia, I don't know. We don't live in Colorado. People can accept brownies from strangers. It's like that Iron Man line from the first one. It's just like, we don't live in Canada. You can't leave your house unlocked at night. Iron Man 2. But Iron Man 2, yeah. That's funny. I didn't think about the connotation of brownies being given out by random people before. I doubt that was intentional. That it, I no, we talked funny. about that in the episode review. Did we? Yeah, I remember that because oh. I brought it up and you're like, oh my gosh, Olivia, <laughs> no. Don't remember that. Okay, anyways, uh, so next episode then is uh, Wild West Sausage Fest. <laughs> Which, <laughs> Never well, say that again. When I came up with that episode, that title, and realized that it rhymed... I knew that there was no more theory. We had to do this music review solely so that I could say that title I came up with the episode because I didn't come up with that during the review. Yes. You are a terrible person. Wild West Sausage Fest. Stop the saying it. The one that it. only in the album review we realized had no female characters whatsoever. It didn't? No. Oh, right. No. Yeah. Remember, we pointed that out. Yeah, and the... then you're like, oh, even less points. Yeah. Yeah. Because he points it out. He's like, wow. Mr. Whitaker, I really love the script. It's even better because there's no girls at all. And, and Wick's like, yep. And I'm like, okay, so uh, yeah, I was like, wow, that's actually a really good name I came up with there. I wish I'd thought of that sooner. It's like, this is the only redeeming thing about this episode, and it's actually making fun of this episode. Yes, and you should all know that the only reason that we actually went through with doing this entire review video was so that I could let you all know that I came up with that name. I didn't know that until now, and I wish I never heard it. I wanted to tell you about it, but I'm like, no, it's so funny. I need to wait for Victoria's reaction on camera. Was that so, that uh, thing when you're like, I want to tell you about this, but I can't tell you about this that you said to me the other day? Maybe. Probably. <laughs> um, I can't believe you. Probably. Um, I, I don't really know what to say for this one. Like, you know, the score is 
exactly what you'd expect. It's a bunch of Western stuff focusing around the lone lawman theme. I actually thought the music from this one was pretty good. It is. I just I was mean like, like listening to it, I'm like, man, this is pretty good. And I checked the episode and I was like, darn it, I don't like this episode. Yeah, I just mean like, you know, it's what you'd expect. Insert Michael Bluth Arrested Development. I don't know what I expected gif in here. Um so there's some intense music at the beginning, much more intense than the actual episode, I should point out. Um, and then, you know, it goes through all the different things. The nice thing about this one, at least, is that the music was distinctive enough in the actual episode that I specifically and precisely recognized it when listening to the score. Like, I feel like this one had the most memorable music out of the album that I actually, like, remembered what it sounded like later on and stuff, probably because it was so stereotypically building on very concrete old Western music themes. Devin. Yeah? We've almost been talking for 20 minutes. I know. How? I didn't I think we had that much to say about this. Never underestimate ourselves. I know even I said 20 minutes absolute max, and there we just hit it. Not for these guys, though, because it'll cut the first couple seconds. But still, yes, we are going to go slightly over 20 minutes. Okay, uh, next episode is April, June, and Jvember. So, uh, I told you, good titles, right? Yeah. Just get April, April, June, and Jvember. I get it. <laughs> so this one starts off uh, slightly mischievous, which is presumably for Jay and Brian sneaking into Wit's walk-in freezer. And then it moves on to some light and silly tones. And then it goes into some, like, nursery chime tunes, I'm guessing, for the library read-along bit. Bring Riley back, 2015. Yeah. 2K15. Um, 20K15. <laughs> I said that accidentally one time. Yeah. I meant to say 2K15. I, I think said that was 20K15. No, it wasn't. It was right oh. before filming. Devin yeah. still teases me about it. Um, this is the first time it's been brought up by anyone since it happened, but okay, if you say so. But yes, it's funny. I'm 20 K, you do realize 20K15 is 18,000 years in the future, right? <laughs> Anyways, uh, so then the nursery tunes changed to a slightly more negative tone because Jay, uh, not bad, but like mischievous kind of negative, I guess, but that's already... You know, I've already used the word mischievous once in this review, so it's bad writing to use it again, and I, I don't Wait, like Wait, did you say the... it sounds like a nursery song, then it gets a little bit mischievous? Because yes. if so, that's probably when he's reading the book to that kid, and you start changing. No, it's more like, it. no, it was later on, more chores, where it's like, tee hee hee, Jay's cheating on all the other things, I don't think what, it was What was cool. the book? I remember the book was so funny, but I can't remember what chair. happened. It was like something about a chair. And he makes friends or... with an ottoman. All I remember... And <laughs> the letters. Like, hopefully you're part of the percentage they could read. Or else this is going to be really boring. <laughs> Any comments about this episode. soundtrack song, Victoria? Um, I didn't have many thoughts about it. This was ar around the time a little bit before I thought I was listening to Gravity Falls. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I was, yeah, I don't really remember anything about the song okay so next we have christmas in october so this one starts out with pretty drawn out strings and dramatically emotional while still holding the instruments and plucks that mark slice of life aio scores and then is this uh, one the what's it called the perfect gift. perfect gift yeah so we move then into a brief uh, joy to the world with jingle bells on percussion and such because Christmas, and then because we end Christmas. on, and then we end on the AIO motif, but with Christmas rhythm that we've heard many a time before. I just listening to it and just sitting there, and I was like, "Man, Odyssey Christmas songs, like they're just so good." Every single Odyssey episode with music, just could listen to the music all the time. <sighs> Odyssey know. music, Christmas. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, so we have the next episode for November now. The one that's totally about adoption and not about disabilities and ableism is what I titled it. Good so, title. I you. approve. It, and it does sound like a Fall Out Boy title, that one. Um, so <laughs> this one is... Was that last episode or this episode we were making jokes about Fall Out Boy titles? That was 
This it was last episode. episode. It was last episode because we're talking about significance of the insignificant. Um, so uh, the music for this one is Korean, obviously, with heavy focus on pizzicato strings. The drawn-out legato synth tones in the background also made this one feel very much like a Riven soundtrack piece. Um, about halfway through, it finally moves from these somber tones of sadness of, you know, disabled baby abandonment into more lighthearted areas, coming to what I, I personally consider to be the main theme of the episode musically finally comes in with the AIO motif mixed into the Korean strings together. So uh, this, I think this one might be my favorite on the soundtrack. Okay, can I just interject? I have a list of Fall Out Boy songs in my iTunes right now. They don't have long titles. Novocaine, I Don't Care, Immortals, Just When Yesterday, Light Em Up, Phoenix, Remember Me for Centuries is admittedly a long song title, but then like Young Volcanoes. Like, those aren't very long song titles. I don't titles. know where all the long, what all the long song titles are, but I know there were ones that were like 20 words long, and then they... I, remember, I know the famous story is there was the one that was like th a three run-on sentences put together, and their publisher wouldn't let them, and so they actually... So the, they changed the name of the song to something like, our publisher wouldn't let us publish the real title for this song because it was too long, so we used this one. And that's the name of the song. I love Fall Out Boy so much. Anyways, um, then we have the last track of the album, which is Fall On Your Knees. Oh, um, it's so shrill and piercing when she sings it. And I, I'll get this. It's not in the soundtrack. Well, I mean, nope. we'll get to that. So we, we start out. I'm not quite sure how to describe the opening to this one. It started out as a vaguely country-esque twang and then immediately moved to woodblock and stereoscopic sci-fi whoosh sounds spinning around in a foreboding manner. It moved through a bunch of... <laughs> well, remember, Wooten was on drugs for this episode. I'm not sure exactly what if it was supposed to be his weird mixtape that he made it for Penny or whether it was supposed to represent... But it was just really random, and then finally it moved into softer and more comforting music. And then in comes The Twelve Days of Christmas, and then O Come All Ye Faithful, and then Joy to the World, and then the AIO motif. And then it basically ends there, and I was like, what? Like, they didn't have the super dramatic, like, fall on your knees from Penny that she sang at the end of that one scene, which was the most memorable music moment of the entire season. That's actually true. When... Once you get past, like, Penny screeching at that part, the music in that part is so beautiful. And, like, the transition, I just love it so much. I didn't really think about the music until the documentary for that episode, and they ended one of the segments of the documentary with the raw music for that segment. It just, like, whooshes up. Yeah, it's, like, big... it's like the snowstorm she was caught in. It's like a huge gust of yeah. wind hits you, and then it just keeps on carrying. They put that instrumental cue into the documentary. And that's what made me really notice it. That was the most memorable music moment of the entire OAC 2014 season, and it didn't make it into the track, so that was really weird. So, anyways, overall, for this album, uh, definitely wish the songs were longer. Each one was only about uh, 2 minutes 50 seconds on average, and most of them were around the 2 minutes 30 second-ish range. Um, most of them gave a good range of feelings and tunes from the episodes, and some of them were able to elicit specific scenes from the episode, which is very good. It's a great start, and it's the closest we've ever had, it's the closest we've ever been to getting raw OST tracks for AIO. But it would still be nicer if we actually did get the original raw soundtrack tracks. Did you just say OST track? Yes. I, that was a neologism, wasn't it? Whatever. You said original soundtrack track. 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 Yes, That's I did. It's like R.I.P. in pieces. Yes, but R.I.P. in peace is a joke on purpose. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But you said it not on purpose, and that's the sad part. Yeah, whatever. It would have been nice if we got the raw originals, but we didn't. It would, like I said before, it would be cheaper for focus. It would save time for John Campbell, and we would get longer stuff as fans, we get the longer tracks straight from the episode, so I don't know why they didn't do that. Maybe they thought people didn't want the raw original tracks for some reason. And they decided to go off the rails from every other soundtrack released from anything I can't ever. shrug anymore. I don't know, but 
overall, because this is the first one that's ever been released, I feel like I should give it 5 out of 5 just because we don't have a baseline to compare it against. I'm so happy that they did anything whatsoever. Um, no, don't do that. That's but no, cheating. I shouldn't. Um, I'll give don't it 4.3 because it was really good, but you know, there's still lots of ways it could have been made better, but overall still really exciting that it happened and good music. So 4.3 is my rating out of 5. I'm going to say 3.7 because... I really liked it. Some of the songs, like I said, Mission Unaccomplished and uh, The Launch Part 2 were my favorites out of it. And, yeah, just The Launch Part 2. It's just so, so good. I have to yawn. So good that it made me yawn. Just caught a fly in, a in good my way. So um, where's all the down excitement. marks coming from then? I'm just curious. Uh, the ones I didn't like as much. That's fair. Just, yeah. Okay, so that is that. That is our first music review. And, uh, you know, hopefully more soundtracks will come out for past albums, not just for OAC stuff, so that we can review those as well. And in the meantime, you know, there's also Eugene Sings albums, two of them, which we can also do music reviews on, so... I'll just say the down marks also come from I don't listen to OST stuff that much. That's just instrumental. So I always have really high expectations for the stuff I do listen to. So, yeah. So, what are we doing next time, Victoria? We are reviewing Qua. Um, it is our freebie review for the year. The one review out of the year. Uh, where we don't have to do an OAC episode. Because doing... An episode, doing a, an odd cast episode every two weeks and doing a review every second episode out of that, it means that there's 13 reviews a year, you know, not including special ones for the new season stuff. 13 reviews a year, but only 12 OAC episodes. So every year we get one special episode where we get to review whatever we want for both episodes. So what did we pick for this? Or what did you pick for this, rather? Accid okay, Accidental Dilemma. Parts yep. It's one and two. We are going tackling, in terms of two-parters, a uh, pretty controversial one in terms of fan reception to it. Uh, lots. Of people... I wanted to choose a controversial two-parter. Yeah, it was either of... this or Blackguard's Revenge. Which lots of was people Devin's not very happy choice. about this episode, so we'll talk about that next time and all the things that go into that. But until then, and we get to talk about the whisperer. Jason, what a I sound like Jeff doing Trevor. Um, until then, thank you for joining us on our side of the YouTube. This has been Devin Francis, also known as Leonard Meltzner. And this has been the Victoria. <laughs> and until next time, thank you for joining us on the Adventures in Odyssey podcast. This episode was longer than I thought it would be. Yeah, it was. Goodbye. Bye.